I am Judy Newton. I am chairperson of the Levy Senior Center Foundation, and we are happy to welcome you to today's Levy Longevity Program. This new series is presented in conjunction with Amita Health and the City of Evanston. In these sessions, we will discuss common issues of concern for adults 55 plus. But more importantly, our mission is to come together in the spirit of life and learning to help us age well. As always, we appreciate your support of the foundation as we continue to work to connect our community of older adults. A special thanks to Amita for embarking on this journey with us. And we are excited to welcome today, Dr. Clifton Saper, lead clinical psychologist of Amita Health, who will be talking about something relevant to all of us how to deal with the stress and reentry after a year of COVID-19 isolation. I am happy to introduce our moderator for today, Sam Cochran, Amita Sports Medicine Outreach Liaison, who will introduce Dr. Saper. Thank you, Sam, and it's all yours. Thank you, Judy. Um, as she said, my name is Sam Cochran and I am an athletic trainer by trade and the sports medicine liaison in the Chicago metro region with Amita Health. I'm first going to start off by going over some housekeeping items. First, all attendees are muted for the duration of the presentation. Questions may be submitted using the Q&A feature in the bottom center of your screen. Please do not use the raise hand or chat feature or attempt to unmute. We will not be able to hear or see you. Next, at registration, you were able to pre-submit questions. Similar questions were grouped together and addressed in the presentation. Additional questions will be answered at the end of the presentation during the Q&A portion. Additionally, it is not permitted for this presentation to be recorded by attendees. However, it is being recorded and will be available on the Levy Foundation YouTube channel and website. Lastly, the presentation is intended for information purposes only and is not intended to replace individualized care provided by your respective doctors or practitioners. Amita Health and the Levy Foundation are not liable for the misuse of any information presented today. Now, I would like to introduce to you our speakers. Today, we have Dr. Clifton Saper and Victoria Storm. Dr. Saper is a licensed clinical psychologist and is the lead psychologist for Amita Health and the director of the Behavioral Medicine Service Line. Additionally, we have Victoria Storm, who is a clinical musical therapist with Amita Health. She has also done a TED Talk on music therapy and coping with stress. Now I turn it over to you, Dr. Saper. Thanks so much, Sam. I really appreciate being here. And I understand that many of you of our 270 people that are already on are on your lunch break. So we're gonna jump right in. What I'd like you to think about is how stressed are you? Are you losing your stripes? Next slide. So what I want you to do right now, right here, is rate your stress level. From zero, I don't have a care in the world. I feel very relaxed and calm and all is right in my life. That's a zero. Up to 10, which is I'm jumping out of my skin, I'm scared of leaving my cave and returning to public life. I'm anxious about returning to work. I'm sweating. I have a fast heartbeat. That's a 10. How would you rate your stress right now? We're gonna ask you again at the end of our talk to see if there's been a change. Thank you to the Levy Center Foundation and Amita Health for inviting me to be a speaker for the longevity series. And how appropriate how appropriate, as Judy said, this topic is, as we all have lived through an amazing and challenging year, and now we grapple with the prospect of getting vaccinated and emerging from our caves, and of course, reconnecting with our loved ones and friends and traveling. This has created for all of us stress, anxiety, and a good deal of worry. I must ad admit, in an era where transparency is critical, that I myself am a Levy Center participant, especially their live and virtual musical offerings. Corky Siegel was amazing, wasn't he? Also, my wife is a senior games basketball player 
on a team sponsored by the Levy Center Foundation. In fact, she took a photo, an award-winning photo during the pandemic of her team recently. And here it is. This photo is going to appear in the annual report of the Levy Center Foundation. So look for it there. She found that you can still find fun and camaraderie even in very difficult times. Today, we're going to explore your current and chronic sources of stress. We're gonna talk about the emotional, cognitive and behavioral results of anxiety. We're gonna dis going discuss alternative op actions to, to hiding or drinking or just being crabby. And as a bonus, we're gonna learn how music can be a useful coping tool because it has helped me personally and that we've helped our frontline healthcare workers at Amita Health with music in our virtual peer support groups. And we're gonna practice at the end, a mindfulness exercise. As this requires your interaction and sharing, please put your comments in the Q&A box. And many of you have already sent those comments in and we'll deal with them as it comes up. Again, healing comes through sharing. So please put your responses in the Q&A. So I'd like to start with a reflection that we often use with our Amita frontline healthcare workers in our virtual peer support groups. This is called I Worried by Mary Oliver. I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will, it, will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it. And I am, well, hopeless. Is my eyesight fading or am I just imagining it? Am I going to get rheumatism, lockjaw, dementia? Finally, finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing and gave it up and took my old body and went out into the morning and sang. And speaking of singing, Victoria Storm has something special for you. Thank you so much, Cliff. Um, next slide. Here on, the, uh, on your uh, screen, you can see the words to a song that I'd like to share with you. And if you are so willing, once you get a sense of the tune, you can join, join me in singing it as well. So part of the important part of this is to take your hands and place it upon your heart. So if you're just going to listen, that's fine too, but listen with your heart. Here we go, it goes like this. Place your hand upon your heart. Set your heart upon your deepest wish. Send your wish to the place where the sun begins. And you'll find peace of mind. Place your hand upon your heart. Let your heart fill all the love there is. Send your love to the place where the moon begins and you'll find peace of mind. Place your hand upon your heart. Let your heart be as still as still can be. Send your calm to the place where stars begin and you'll find peace of mind. You will find peace of mind. And I hope that you can go into this presentation in that 
place of calm, of centeredness, and peace of mind. Thank you. Cliff? Thanks, Victoria. So many of you received these worksheets this morning, and uh, we'll go to the next slide. So um, we really want you to put in the Q&A your responses, and then Sam will look at some of them and see which ones would be useful in talking about, because as was mentioned, many of them have common themes. So these stress management workshops will help you identify the causes of stress and find healthy coping skills, skills to deal with stress and find ways to take care of yourself both physically and emotionally to better withstand stress. So stress is the body's response to stressful situations, oftentimes conflict, loss, and overcommitment are causes for stress. What's, what's causing your stress? What are the things that you have found stressful over the past few weeks? Sam, what have some people said? Um, some anxiety around uh, vaccine availability is. Yeah, we're hearing that. Um, how can I access the vaccine? And how do I sign up for it? And the computer glitches and it's so difficult. Do I go to Jewel or Walgreens or an Amita hospital or my doctor? Um, and I'm hearing different things from different friends and relatives. And that's been very stressful. So as we're coming out of uh, the anxiety about this pandemic, now trying to find a vaccine, not only for ourselves, but for our family members has been a stress. What about chronic stresses? What are some of the biggest causes of stress for you over the past year or more? We have some people that submitted, um, they're stressed and worried about their family members that live far away um, over the last year and being caretakers for other family members. Yeah, and again, I hear this in my office and we hear it from our peer support groups of healthcare workers that worrying about family is the number one thing that folks worry about. Um, are they gonna be safe? Are they gonna be uh, able to get vaccines? Are they gonna be able to be tested to see if in fact they have had COVID or have had COVID? And then that they're so far away and it's so difficult to connect. And I just wanna be able to hug my family members and friends that are at so far and all I can do is see them on a Zoom call. That's been a chronic stress this year. And so what's bothering you the most today, right now? One of the things that, that we got uh, on your responses early this morning was going back into public is really bothering me today. Um, having a birthday party who should I invite? Can I invite people? Can people be together? Or do we need to be in the backyard? Um, also, disappointment with my spouse or friends, or not, not only disappointment, but disagreement about what is high risk. Can we go to the movies? Can we go to the restaurants? Can we go to a public concert? And my feeling about it might be very different than my friends or my spouse. And, and that conflict creates stress for me. Um, I'm vaccinated, somebody wrote, but my spouse is not. What can we do? Can we go out? Where can we go? And can we do it together? And then somebody wrote and said, I'm planning a trip. Um, my sister died this spring and we want to go to New York to, to celebrate her life. But I have a fear of even uh, entering an airport. And then some of you, and this is not uncommon, have a fear of injections. So, you know, we talk a lot about vaccine hesitancy, but do you know that 20 to 30% of adults have from mild anxiety to severe phobias, and it's called trip trypanophobia, a fear of injections. That's a large number. And so it's not only hesitancy or political feelings, it's actually the fear of getting a shot. And so some of you are feeling that right now. Um, I'd like to say one, a couple words just about the fear of injections. 
because we think it's so important at Amita that you all are going to get vaccinated. So if you have that anxiety about getting vaccination, bring somebody as a support with you. Um, tell the nurse before you're getting the shot about your fears. And then um, if you're feeling faint, to clench your fist and to uh, tense your muscles, and that'll help you not faint. And if you feel like you'd rather get the shot lying down so you don't fall down, go ahead and ask the nurse if she can give you the shot lying down. And then um, it's important if you have this anxiety not to look and to do something that's distracting. Sing a song, wiggle your toes, um, take deep breaths, those kinds of things we're finding with people that have uh, injection phobia, that those things help. Plus, you know, on the, in the media, of course, they've, they've become almost obsessive about showing you people's arms with uh, needles going in them. And I don't know that that's all that helpful for those of you that are anxious about shots. However, the more you watch it and sit through it and see that in fact, nothing bad happens to you, you don't faint or whatever, that does, you do become habituated and it might help, in fact, when you get the shot for the real, in the real life. Next slide. Dr. Saper, we have a few other things that I think okay. um, would, I think we can relate to as early as this morning is the overwhelming number of Zoom activities and having technical difficulties and stress over that. Um, and then and also the, um, politics and violence in America that's going right now, it seems to be stressing a lot of people out. Yeah, and you know, the media is uh, stuck on um, all of the negative and violence that's occurring. And um, you can easily become addicted to watching the news. And uh, we're hearing that all over the place, that people are um, stressed about the polarization, the politics, racial injustice, and, um, and the use of guns and the violence. So um, it's, it's very important to allow yourself to take a break from the negative news and turn it off. You don't have to hear the whole Chauvin uh, court hearing. You can hear a summary for five minutes at the end of the day. Uh, it's, important, uh, it's important to understand that the, your feelings of anxiety are normal that in fact, during this pandemic, your feelings of nervousness, depression, anxiety, and stress are normal. We are all in this same boat together. And your feelings about what's happening in our society and you being anxious about that is normal. What tends to happen is that we beat ourselves up for, being, um, for having these feelings where we need to show ourselves more self-compassion. It's okay to be not okay. Next slide. So stress results in some of these physical symptoms. And I know many of you out there have felt these symptoms of headaches, back pain, neck pain, chest pain, problems with digestion or nausea, shaking, sweating, dizziness, numbness or tingling are all physical symptoms of stress. And there are also some common emotional and behavioral and cognitive symptoms of stress. We can become irritable and crabby and crying. We easily can get frustrated, angry, impatient, be exhausted, emotional fatigue, feelings of being burned out about our lives or our work, and then finding a a decrease in our productivity and having difficulty concentrating and even having memory problems and confusion are all very common signs of stress. So it's important, however, that you see um, a healthcare professional to determine whether it's these symptoms are, are, these symptoms are a result of stress and anxiety because stress and anxiety can cause these symptoms. However, it can also, stress can also contribute to symptoms that are caused by another illness. So you wanna try to tease out what is my anxiety doing? And then do I have other medical issues that the anxiety is just exacerbating 
these symptoms. Plus now with the vaccine and what we're hearing lately on the news is perhaps there are some side effects to the vaccines and um, most of them of course are very minor, but if they continue for weeks, that's where you need to also tease out, is this a side effect of a vaccine? Is this stress or is this another medical illness that's going on? Next slide. So how do you know when you're feeling stressed? Put something in the Q&A and let me know how do you know when you're starting to feel stressed? I have some uh, responses in here. Great. Chronic fatigue, um, lack of motivation, overeating. Yeah, you know, th this morning when we had trouble with the Zoom, uh, the technical problems that someone raised, that's really stressful. It stressed me out. And the first thing I wanted to do was eat a bar of chocolate. So um, overeating, uh, going for the chocolate is certainly a one way that we know that oh, I'm feeling stressed. Some of us have a short fuse or become really irritable or others of us just wanna go back to bed, pull the covers over our head and hide. What about early warning signs of stress? What are the first things that you notice when you start experiencing stress? What do you all think? Um, some responses are muscle tension, headaches, um, feeling lightheaded, or having trouble sleeping. Yeah, I think those are really important early warning signs, which should be a signal to us that I need to start doing something differently um, because I'm, I'm starting to get stressed. One of the things that happens to me is I start to lose things. You know, where are my glasses? Uh, where did I put the keys? Um, did I actually buy the deodorant at the store or did I forget it? Um, those kinds of things you'll notice happen more to you, which should be an early warning sign that I'm experiencing stress. Or I have difficulty focusing or concentrating or sticking with one thing at a time. One of the things that has happened to us during this pandemic year is multitasking like crazy, we can't even concentrate on one Zoom webinar or one Netflix movie. We have to be doing three things at the same time and we get uh, flustered and confused. What about chronic symptoms of long-term stress? Are there any symptoms that, that you have often? So, some of you have talked about the stomach aches or or the headaches, or just feeling exhausted. And those, those are typical chronic symptoms. Next slide. So I wanted to give you a few statistics on the pandemic toll on mental health. This is called from the New York Times from a couple of weeks ago, April 4th, we have hit the wall confronting pandemic burnout. And it was a survey done by MetLife of their 2000 651 employees. And I wanted you to go through these statistics with me because it's not only you, it's all of us all across the country. 34% of respondents, MetLife employees reported feeling burned out, which was up 27% from last April. 22% reported feeling depressed, which was up 17% from last April. And 37% reported feeling stressed up from 34% last April. And re respondents reported less productivity, less engagement, and less success. In a, time new, in a New York Times survey, respondents reported anhedonia, which is basically a lack of interest and lethargy. And at, at McGill, um, researchers found that the respondents reported that time is moving differently from exhausting experiences which were lasting forever to no time at all. And I found this true that weeks are going flying by, but at other times the day just never seems to end. And I'm sure some of you have felt that as well. Plus respondents reported more negative content to their memories. 
and respondents report reduced ability to hold a thought in their minds and paying attention. I bring this up because if you are having these feelings, I want you to know that you are not alone, that in fact, it's normal on an extended trauma that we've all been experiencing to have some of these feelings. Next slide. The Stress in America survey done by the American Psychological Association this February showed that 61% of us experienced undesired weight changes since the start of the pandemic. I know you can all relate to this. 42% of you reported gaining more weight than you intended. And of those, they gained an average of 29 pounds. The median was 15 pounds. Those of you that are watching this webinar on your lunch break, good for you. Perhaps you won't have to eat so much for lunch. 67% of us report sleeping issues, as many of you have reported. That's two thirds of us have sleeping issues. I had difficulty last night staying, I could fall asleep, but staying asleep was hard. And probably it was because of facing this webinar this afternoon. 23% of adults report drinking more alcohol. 25% have been diagnosed with a mental health disorder this year compared to 9% previously. And half of our respondents feel uneasy about adjusting to in-person interaction, which is why we're doing this webinar. Half of us feel uneasy about this adjustment as the pandemic is ending. And this was true for those of you who are vaccinated as well as, as, well as those of you who have not been vaccinated. And people of color reported a much higher percentage of unintended physical changes, sleep issues, uneasiness about returning to in-person interaction and resuming their pre-pandemic lives than reported by white people. Next slide. So I wanted to let you know that our physicians at Amita felt very similar to the way you all and the general public felt. And so we developed a survey and gave our physicians this survey in December. 81% of our physicians were married or in a relationship. 72% of them are parents, 41% care for kids under 18, and 10% are caring for an older family member. 54%, more than half of our physicians say that their family life has been negatively impacted this past year. And 78% of doctors have experienced heightened anxiety or other challenging emotions. Next slide. We, uh, we gave these 34 questions to over 8,000 physicians in the AMIDA network, and we ran this survey between December 5 and December 30th. Next slide. 63% of our docs have treated COVID patients that have passed away, and 35% have lost family members, friends, or acquaintances to COVID. And 25% of our docs said their physical health has suffered. Next slide. So how do you usually handle stress? List your usual coping habits. If you could write in the Q&A, what are some things that you do to handle stress? Uh, we have some answers here. Someone has deep breathing exercises. Great. Um, also disconnecting, like doing something mindless, uh -huh. meditation, taking a walk, a lot of exercise related. Great. Yeah, sort of uh, people also are binge watching shows on Netflix and um, other people are finding, I notice, um, talking is a good way to, for them that they handle stress and going out in nature. And we've heard a lot about people taking up baking or gardening or going out with their dogs. Dogs have had it really good this past year, getting lots of walks. So those are uh, coping strategies that people have found helpful. How effective are the coping behaviors that you've used in the past? Do, do they reduce or eliminate the stress? Has anybody uh, commented on that? 
give everyone a few seconds to respond. Yes, uh, people have said it has helped tremendously, works for me, distracts from the stress. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it does not. Great. And then what are some coping techniques that you, that you used in the past but are no longer using? Great. Well, maybe that means that some of you, the toping strategies you always used to use are, have been helpful. I'm hoping that you've dropped out some of the coping strategies that you used to use that were not very healthy, such as drinking or using drugs or staying in bed all day or um, uh, doing things that are, that are just not healthy and you know, smoking, et cetera. We have a lot of overeating and overeating, yeah. 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 And cutting out the sweets and that sort of thing. Yeah. And what about music? Have some of you found that music is helpful? A lot well, of people have put in here music, um, either playing or listening to. Great. Great. Let's go to the next slide. So choose one of your stress causes and then how can this situation be changed or improved? For example, relationship stress. Um, what I found is that it's all about communicating your anxiety with somebody else. Many of you have wrote in and said that you have difficulty figuring out what you should do, could do or not do, given this pandemic and coming out of your isolation, and that perhaps your husband or your wife uh, is more open to doing a little bit more risky behavior than you are, um, and that you're not in agreement at times uh, with your spouse. And the perception of risk is very subjective. So what I suggest to couples that I see is that first of all, they each do their own research and look at the science about risk and the science that they feel comfortable with about uh, what risks are, are we willing to take. And then I have each of the spouses rate what they feel is the risk number of the thing they've suggested. And to go from low risk to high risk. So for example, one spouse has said to me, low risk would be uh, taking my uh, child um, on a nature walk and we're both wearing masks and there are very few people, low risk. Whereas high risk would be to go to an indoor rock concert where people aren't wearing masks and they're young and uh, don't seem to uh, understand the pandemic at all. I then have the other, and I have them assign a number of risk to those situations. I have the other spouse then come up with their understanding of risk. So the other spouse might say, low risk might be taking my kid to a playground where there are other kids and the kids are not wearing masks. A high level of stress might be being um, in a crowded uh, restaurant uh, where people are not spaced. And then I have them rate the risk level. And oftentimes the spouses come up with different risk levels and I have them talk to each other, communicate, which for some people is an unusual thing to be able to communicate with your spouse of can we come to a risk level that we can both agree on. It might not be exactly where I am or where my spouse is, but it's something that we could agree on. And we've now taken all of the emotion out of it. It's important to be empathic, understanding, and listen, rather than think that there's one right or wrong answer. The other issue that comes up is friends and relatives. They may, uh, friends and relatives may have a different perception of what's risky and what's stressful rather than tell them they're wrong or that tell them to read the research or order them to do something they're uncomfortable with. It's important for us to listen, to be understanding 
and allow yourself to say, that's the way you feel. And this is the way I feel, which is might be different. If all of your friends are going to see a movie and you feel uncomfortable with that or feel that it's high risk, it's important to, for you to be able to say to yourself, I um, am uncomfortable going to the movie, but you all can go to the movies if, if you feel comfortable. And it doesn't mean that I don't like you guys as friends. It doesn't mean that I'm holding it against you. It's my own, my own feeling uh, risk assessment. So I'm not rejecting you as my friends. And that gets into relationship stress, to be assertive and communicate and to set boundaries and resolve conflict rather than just stuffing your feelings of anxiety. To be able to talk about the feelings and share them does not make you weak. To be able to mention that you might be vulnerable, it does not make you um, a less of a person. The other issue is overcommitment. Um, that's often a situation that causes stress, doing too much, not being able to say no. And as our schedules become so jammed up, even if it's with Zoom seminars, webinars, uh, uh, different kinds of activities, to be able to say no and be able to allow yourself during the day to take a break, to breathe, and to spend some time alone or in mindful meditation. And then grief and loss can certainly cause uh, stress. And it's important to be able to reach out. There is no shame in seeking support. And we've all suffered this year. We've all uh, lost family, family members. We've all lost friends. And it's important to be able to talk about it, to seek support. And some of us may need mental health professionals to help with that support. And there should be no stigma or shame in getting that support. Other people found that journaling or finding enjoyable activities to fill your day is really important. And even if you're grieving, even if you have felt a loss, even if you have had a really anxiety difficult several months, it's important that you allow yourself to have some joy and not beat yourself up about, I shouldn't be happy given all that's happened. It's, it's okay to be happy. Let's go to the next slide. So these are some effective coping strategies. It's important to use a variety of coping strategies to manage your stress that's inevitably going to occur. It occurred all during this year and it's going to occur, occur as you emerge from your caves. By regularly practicing coping strategies, you can stop stress from building up and prevent stress overload. Not all stressful situations are within our control and not every situation can be changed. Effective, healthy coping skills can allow you to get through difficult times. One of the things I'm hopeful about, and I talk to our physicians and our healthcare workers about this all the time, as well as our leaders at Amita, is what have we learned during this year? What have we learned during the pandemic? Are there any things, any skills, any ways that we have managed to practice self-care that we want to carry into the future? Are there ways that we can make our work, our behavior, our productivity perhaps more efficient? And are there ways that we can be more empathic with each other and acknowledging each other? And also, have we learned to be more self-compassionate? These, This is the silver lining to this uh, extended traumatic event that's gone on all year. If we don't take learnings from it, it's all been for naught. If we can have learned something about how to live a better life, both at home and at work, then perhaps there's been some positives. This is a good time for me perhaps to read the serenity prayer, which is something that we use in our treatment facilities across the board. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, 
and the wisdom to know the difference. It's important to not worry about those things that are not going to be able to be changed by you, but there's some things that can, you can change, like you can start to use relaxation strategies, and we're going to practice one today. You can start journaling or writing down or dictating your, your thoughts, your feelings, deep breathing, which we will also practice today. And many of you have brought up the notion of exercise. So I'd like you to think about some coping strategies that have worked for you in the, the past and that you would like to use regularly and maybe come up with three new coping strategies that either you heard here in today's webinar or you've thought about wanting to try like baking or learning to play the guitar. And when are you gonna use these coping techniques? And then after you've identified these coping strategies, how does using them affect your stress level? And what about music? Have you thought about music? Here's Victoria. Next slide, thanks, Sam. Okay, so um, as it says here on the slide, actively making and listening to music. Nice them, but this is what the Italians did uh, to be able to cope with the early days of isolation and quarantining from each other. What did they do? They went out to their balconies, certainly obviously social distanced <laughs> by, by their love of being together. Um, music can activate uh, the system that's associated with our fight, flight, or freeze response. Um, it's that connection between the brain and the gut. Um, you may have experienced that, that when something bad happens, your stomach feels like there's a rock in it. That's that connection. And music is wonderful at soothing that, uh, that system. It also regulates the heart, our heart rates and our blood pressure, and it can moderate our fear and anxiety. And as I mentioned, it connects us to each other. I noticed in the uh, the Q and A that several people are asking questions like, um, "What do we do when other people in our lives are not taking the precautions that we are? What do I do when I'm going back to work and I don't think that my work environment is is safe?" Um, and I know that Dr. Saber is is going to um, be able to answer some of those directly. But as in my perspective as a board certified music therapist, I think that. This is an opportunity to use those coping skills and strategies that he's been talking about to get through those difficult moments and those difficult uh, discussions. I know that in my work environment, um, it has been very pro staff. So we have been very well supported in being able to, to share our worries and anxieties and ask important questions. And even just in asking those questions, we've, we've gained a lot of relief. Um, can we go to the next slide, Samantha? I think it's important for you to think about how you engage in your environment. Um, how do you use music and beyond music? Um, what is your sensory diet? Okay, if you're not a, a music person, are you a uh, a visual person? Are you the kind of person that loves to to visit the art museums or look at beautiful things or? kinesthetic sense, you know, do you want to be in nature? Do you like to, to feel the breeze on your skin? What are the things in your sensory environment that bring you calm? And how do you engage in music? Do you sing? Do you move? Do you play music? Do you listen to it actively or maybe even compose or improvise? You know, I am a big supporter of singing loud in the car or singing that opera song in the shower. Nobody cares what it sounds like. Nobody cares, but your body cares and you can engage in that beautiful music.
music making that comes from your heart and your soul to help get back to that that place of calm that place of uh soothing that place of of baseline and when we're in this heightened state of arousal and of stress it's so important that we return to that that more natural state of calm and baseline um what is your signature song is there a song that you hear in your head that brings you that state of calm, that's that sense of peace. Um, I have one, I have several actually, depending on the situation, I have different songs that I sing to myself. In, in fact, several years ago, I had a, um, a bout of insomnia and I started listening to a, a particular song over and over every night to help me sleep. And now I have trained my body so that I don't even need to listen to the song in, in my environment, I can just think of that song and listen to it in my in my memory and I can lay there in, in bed at three in the morning and I can fall asleep a lot faster because I've trained my body to do it. So I enc encourage you to try and and engage some of those those stress reduction activities through um, your sensory environment. Um, and I really encourage you, as Dr. Dr. Saper also said, maybe don't watch so much news, you know, turn off the news and turn on the music. This is a great opportunity to, to find musicians um, that you may love uh, performing online. And I feel like I know the perform my favorite performers better than I ever did because they have been sharing their um, their music in such personal ways, often from, you know, their their studios or their living room. So it's a great, great chance to to engage in the arts in another way. Think about what you see, what you feel, what you hear, what you taste, and what you smell. Make make that favorite food that uh, reminds you of a happy time in your life. These are all good coping strategies. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Saper, and he's going to talk a little bit more about stress. Thank you. So I had an opportunity to look at some of your comments in the Q&A. So thank you so much for participating. You're the best group that we've had this year in terms of giving us your responses. A couple of you have said, but what about re-entry? And what about the fact that this pandemic is like nothing we've ever experienced before? Um, so that I think what you're implying is that some of my coping strategies are, were not enough to manage through this year? And are my coping strategies going to be enough to help me re-enter and leave my cave? So let me talk a little bit about that, because when you're feeling stressed and when stress is not effectively managed, it's going to create anxiety, which leads to emotional, physical, cognitive, and behavioral difficulties. Those of you that are sitting at home and thinking about going back to work or going shopping or traveling, there is some risk, of course, attached to any of those behaviors, just as any type of risky behavior that you might have been engaged in in the past. But as you've said, this feels different because I've been out of the situation for a whole year and there's still a virus out there. There are still people getting sick and there's still people dying. So what kind of a strategy can I use that's gonna help me? First of all, do not beat yourself up for feeling anxious. We all are feeling anxious as we start to re-enter the world. What I find in my office is that what clients are having the most difficulty with is being very self-critical and judgmental about their fears. So we need to be understanding and say, it's okay to be not okay and to feel fears, which perhaps might be justified. The second piece is that in order to get over anxiety or phobias, you have to gradually expose yourself to the risky situations and see that in fact, nothing happens, nothing bad happens. So perhaps in terms of leaving your home and reintroducing yourself to the world, you need to do it a baby step at a time, which might mean trying to go to work for an hour the first day or going two days a week, or if you're in school to go back live two days a week. 
um, and then eventually work up to full time. If you just hide out and never try to experience um, those risky situations, then you're always going to be frightened of them and it's going to be harder and harder for you to make change. So I'm suggesting that again, you do your research, you see what in fact you're comfortable with and you see in fact what science is saying and then you gradually expose yourself and will then habituate to the anxiety and see that nothing bad happens. If, if it's at a point where you feel uncomfortable, so I think it's the assumption in some of your comments were that your company or your school uh, was not making appropriate accommodations for safety, then you need to speak up and be assertive. And you need to allow, allow people, they have to know that in fact, I'm uncomfortable with the safety arrangements at work and therefore I'm not going to be able to return um, full hog that I'm gonna to have to take it step by step. If you don't speak up and you're not assertive, then in fact, uh, people and employers might not know. Again, there's some things you can change and those things have to do with yourself of how you're managing stress, how you're dealing with your anxiety and how you are, um, how you are communicating that anxiety and vulnerability. And there are other things that perhaps you're not going to be able to change. For example, people in a grocery store who are not wearing masks or people in your neighborhood who seem to not even realize there's a pandemic or that there are still people getting sick from COVID or people at the airport who are jostling you or bumping into you. You're not gonna be able to change everybody else's behavior, but what you can do is say, how can I place myself in a situation that I'm comfortable with and take whatever precautions I feel I need to take in order to be okay. Um, I don't recommend confronting people who are not wearing masks. I do recommend not being in the same place or situation that they are. If it's a work setting and your desk mate is not wearing a mask and it's not socially distant and you feel you have no power um, to, to move or to change the situation, then that's where you need to go to your boss and say, I'm not comfortable with the safety precautions. Next slide. So what we need to do is be able to change our thinking. We need to not be so rigid in our thinking and understand that flexible thinking is important. There isn't one right way to manage our stress and there's not one way to manage the pandemic or to reemerge. We need to be flexible and open to thinking in different ways. Plus, if we think this is never gonna be back to normal, things are never gonna be the same, this is the worst possible way to live, we're, gonna, we're going to be negative in our approach to life. Is there any other way to think? For example, as I brought up, what have I learned about myself during this year? What have I learned about my family? What have I learned about the importance of friends? And can I take that learning and bring it into the future? We need to change our feelings. Um, it's your choice. You can either wake up and be crabby or irritable or angry, or you can be grateful for all that you have, that you have a job, that you have family members, that you have a place to live. And we need to work on changing our behavior. Can I do something differently? Can I expose myself gradually to situations that over the past year, perhaps I've thought were risky? And you know what? Things change. Research changes. That in fact, if you're uh, anxious now about leaving your house in a week or two, as the rates of exposure to COVID go down and the hospitalizations go down, you may feel more comfortable in exposing yourself more to the outside world. Allow yourself to make those changes in your behavior and then to physically relax as we're gonna do in a minute. And if you're so anxious that you're unable to function, perhaps you need to reach out for uh, professional help and support. And there should be no stigma again in getting that help and even in getting medication for anxiety. Next. 
So this is my favorite diet. I just want to go through it quickly. Uh, this is sort of a funny approach. Uh, we all started out having said we're going to eat healthy and we're going to take care of ourselves, but by the end we lose our lose our will. So although it says it's formulated to help women cope with stress, it's good for all of us. So we started great with a grapefruit, wheat toast, and skim milk at breakfast. Then at lunch we started to have some lean steamed chicken with a cup of spinach, and then some her herbal tea and maybe one Hershey's Kiss. By the afternoon tea, we ate the rest of the Hershey Kisses in the bag. We ate a tub of Haagen-Dazs ice cream with chocolate chip topping. And then by dinner time, we had the four glasses of wine, two loaves of garlic bread, one family size Supreme pizza, three Snickers bars, and our late night snack was one whole Sara Lee cheesecake eaten directly from the freezer, stressed, remember stressed spells spelled backward is desserts next so we all started out with good intentions it's important as we have gone through this year to to, to dare to be happy dare to be happy at work as you gradually introduce yourself back to your workplace back to your colleagues Allow yourself to be happy, not to find yourself totally non-functional because of anxiety. Become less controlling. You can't control everything around you. If you let go of some things, you'll feel less anxious. Don't dramatize the deadlines. The deadlines will come. You'll achieve many of them. And don't, don't increase your anxiety and stress by worrying. Don't sweat the bureaucracy. All of our workplaces have some bureaucracy and step back and smile about it rather than get caught up in the anxiety of it all. Remember to acknowledge yourself and others. Be compassionate to yourself. Next slide. Make a list of your personal priorities. You can't get everything done. What's the most important thing? And what's the most important thing in a job for you? Um, and are you making the most of those, those most important things? In my profession, the most important thing is my personal connection with clients. And if administrative work or paperwork, et cetera, is getting in the way of that, then I need to drop that down the list of personal priorities and make sure I'm spending time on helping and caring for others. Examine your rituals and habits and be willing to change some of them. We've all developed habits over this year. Um, and some of them, um, you know, like spraying down every work surface in uh, keeping our hands uh, totally clean. Things in fact that we have found perhaps don't, don't uh, increase the spread of COVID. There may be rituals and habits we've now developed that we're willing to change, and especially at work. What we've learned this year about the need to take a break, the need to be self-compassionate, the need to pat ourselves on the back, those are some habits we need to be doing at work as well. Marvel at how often things go right. You know, I've now been back to work, back to the hospital, and it's amazing what great people there are that work there, how the patients are feeling really good about getting in treatment and being back in the hospital and being cared for. Um, there are a lot of things that are going right, even in spite of this pandemic. Imagine yourself at your own funeral. Do you want somebody to be standing at your casket saying, this was a person that was a workaholic, that was always anxious, that didn't have a sense of humor, that could never see the light of day? Or do you want them to say, this is a flexible, creative, uh, fun, loving person um, who we're all gonna miss? And again, your last one that you all know, your inbox will never be empty. Don't even try by the end of the day to get to the bottom of your inbox because tomorrow it's gonna be full again. Next slide. So what I'd like to do now is to have you focus on the present I'd like you to uh, sit comfortably in your chair, have your butt in your seat unless you're driving. You can shut your eyes or keep them open, whatever's most comfortable. And we're gonna tighten and relax 
all of the muscles in your body. And as we do that, I want you to understand that this is something you could do if you're fearful about getting a vaccination, if you're having a stressful day, if you're depressed, if you're anxious, if you're grieving, this little mindful relaxation we're gonna do is something you can pull out for those occasions. So starting with your feet, I'd like you to tighten your feet, hold them tight, and now slowly let it go. Now I'd like you to hold your legs straight out if you can. Imagine a metal bar running through each leg and all the muscles tightening around it. Hold it tight. Good. Hold it. Now I'm going to change those bars to rubber and let the muscles relax and your feet gently fall to the floor. Now I want you to tighten your butt. Imagine a block of concrete, hard, rigid. Hold it tight. Good. Now I want you to imagine a bowl of pudding. Let the muscles in your butt just relax. Good. Now I want you to tighten your abs. Those of us that have gained the 19 to 29 pounds might be a little bit more challenging, but tighten those abs. Hold them tight. Good. Hold it. Hold it. And now slowly let it go. Good. Now I want you to make fists. Hold your fists tight. Tight. Good. Hold it. And now slowly let it go. Let your hands feel relaxed. They'll feel a little bit clammy. Now I want you to hold your arms straight out and imagine a metal bar running through each arm and all the muscles are tightened around that metal bar. Hold it. Good. Now I'm going to change the metal bar to rubber and let your hands just gently fall back to your lap. Now I want you to imagine that metal bar is running through your shoulders and into your neck. Hold it tight. Tight. Good. Good. And now we're going to change that to rubber and slowly let your shoulders relax. Let your head just wobble from side to side feeling relaxed and comfortable. Now I want you to tighten your face muscles. Scrunch up your face, your eyebrows, your mouth. Hold it tight, nobody can see you. Hold it, hold it, good, good. And now slowly let it go. Let your skin just smooth out. Let it be relaxed and comfortable. Now I want you to tighten your chest. Hold your chest muscles tight. Tight, good, hold it, hold it. And now slowly let it go. And now we're gonna start working on our breathing. I'd like you to do one thing for me. As you're breathing in and breathing out, I'd like you to imagine a magical moment that you've had on a vacation in the past because very few of us have had vacations during this year, but I'd like you to imagine a vacation moment that you had in the past, whether it's in the mountains or by a stream or with your family or floating on a rubber raft in a pool or at the beach or at a Venice cathedral. Imagine that vacation moment. And if you haven't had a vacation in years, then imagine a vacation moment that you would like to have. I want you to implant that in your head as we do our breathing. I'd like you to breathe in through your nose. Hold it. And blow it out through your mouth. In through your nose. Hold it. Good. And blow it out through your mouth. And one more time, in through the nose, hold it, and blow it out through your mouth. And now I'd like to go to Victoria. Next slide, I'd like to in 
invite you to sing a few words with me and your words are breathe in breathe out that's all you need to do I'll do it with you the first time and then I'm going to continue the song and we're going to go through this fairly quickly um, I want you to also be aware that these resources are available to you and we'll give you links to them after the program so if it's not enough for one time you'll get a chance to do more here we go it goes like this breathe in breathe out keep going breathe in breathe out when i breathe in i breathe in peace when i breathe out i breathe out love when i breathe in i breathe in peace when i breathe out keep going i breathe out love when i breathe in i breathe in peace when i breathe out i breathe out love when i breathe in i breathe in peace when i breathe out i breathe out love all together breathe in breathe out breathe in breathe out a few more times breathe in breathe out last time breathe in breathe out thank you thank you victoria and let's go to the last next slide so what i want you to do now is one more thing you, you 250 people have been incredible today. I'd like you now to just rate your stress level now. And from zero is I'm so relaxed, I'm so comfortable. Um, and 10 is I'm jumping out of my skin. So I'd like you to uh, rate where your stress level is after having been through this webinar. I know that my level dropped two points now that I finished this presentation and I'm ready to tackle the rest of the day. So I'd like you to rate your stress level before we get to some of your questions that we weren't able to answer. Great. So some people said my level dropped seven points. That's incredible. Someone went from a four to a three. Somebody dropped three points. Somebody didn't change at all. So let's go to our question and answers. Sam, you want to run that piece? Sure. I have some questions that have been submitted. Um, one in particular, I think, is about personality types and being able to confront those stressful situations where they may need to stand up for themselves. How can someone manage that and be able to give themselves the courage to, you know, maybe address some of those situations or work up the courage to even take those baby steps to start, you know, changing their habits and behavior? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I noticed, you know, somebody mentioned that they were sort of shy and that uh, stepping up and stepping out and being assertive was uncomfortable. Um, I think what this pandemic has done is now has allowed you an opportunity to look at yourself and to see what behaviors would I like to work on and would I like to change? Uh, for example, I'm seeing a high school senior in my office on Zoom. And uh, he is um, graduating from high school. Um, and of course, uh, that's all online, graduation online, et cetera. And he's sort of a shy person, but yet is heading for college in the fall and wanted to make sure that he had the skills necessary to connect with others, to talk with others, um, to be able to be out there in a way that he wasn't in high school, where he sort of uh, just, faded into the background. 
So what he and I have been working on is small steps, small challenges. For example, for him, I said, find a friend that you, uh, someone at school, because he's going to school uh, several days a week for hybrid learning, find somebody you don't know that well and uh, start to address them. Um, and the way you need to start that conversation is just by listening, uh, not necessarily sharing a lot about yourself, but showing somebody that you're curious and interested in them. Um, people like to talk in general. Uh, what people don't like is somebody that is a showboat. Um, so to work on listening skills and empathy skills and skills of curiosity is a good way to start those baby steps in getting out. Um, the worst is if you don't try anything. So you find the smallest step that's appropriate for you, that's most com that's comfortable for you, whether it means just walking to the end of your driveway and gradually expand your repertoire to more and more risky type situations that in the past would have made you feel uncomfortable. But having been through a year of a pandemic where what could even be worse than this, you've now learned some strategies to be able to, to make some changes in your behavior and your flexibility in your thinking. Great, thank you. There's another question kind of related to that. I feel like they've spent so much time in isolation, they've really lost a lot of their social skills and how to re-engage with people appropriately um, and rebuilding that skill set. Yeah, you know, I think one thing that's really helpful is we're all there. We have all been there. We have now know how to talk to people on Zoom. Uh, when I first seeing, started seeing patients by Zoom, I thought I am never gonna be able to do this. I'm not getting all of the social cues that I'm used to getting in my office. Um, so it's, it's important. The first thing to realize is that all of us are experiencing that deterioration of our social skills and how to talk to others. Once you know that you're not alone and that there's not something wrong with you, I think it's helpful. Again, I think it's important to take small steps. And that might mean starting with a phone call, then a FaceTime call, a Zoom call, and then meeting up with a neighbor uh, you know, on your street that you feel comfortable uh, so socializing with. And again, asking questions, listening, being empathic and supportive is the best way, I think, to start practicing that socialization and practicing and reinforcing those social skills. I think reinforcement is important so that in order, you need to reinforce yourself with whatever works for you, listening to a great song or watching a great movie after you've done one of these small challenging behaviors and then increase the behaviors as you go along. That's some really great advice. Um, we have some more about uh, coping mechanisms in regards to healthy ones. So some people have said that exercise was a really healthy coping me mechanism for them, but as of late, they've lost the motivation to engage in those and how do they get back or find ways to regain that motivation? How about it? It's hard to stay motivated to keep that exercising going. I found that it was really difficult to do it at home. And it wasn't until the Y opened up again. And, and by the way, the Y is very safe uh, with all of their precautions. But it wasn't until I could get out of the house and go to the Y that it, I could really get that structured um, program of exercise going again. So the first step is you have to put it on your calendar. If it's not on your calendar, it ain't going to happen. We all know that. And you have to provide the structure. So what time of day, where will it be? What exercise will it be? And you have to start small. You're not going to run a marathon on your first outing. It might just be around the block. It might just be walking. And then each day, and you put this on your calendar, you expand your goal and your objective. And so you find yourself increasing that habit. And it is a habit. Um, it's important to examine 
why you've got the lack of motivation? Is it because of a lack of structure or are you depressed and anxious? Um, and if you're depressed and anxious and exhausted, then in fact, exercise is exactly the antidote that you wanna do in order to come out of that, in order to cope with those, not retreat to your bed or to the couch or to watching movies, unless it's a reinforcer for some of that behavior. So, um, you know, it, we often say that if you do it for eight times in a row, do your exercise for eight days in a row, it will become more like a habit. And again, this is just habit formation, but you've had a year of getting out of that habit. So good luck. And we all need it, right? Yeah. We need it. Is I'd like to say that that it's the same goes for that sensory diet that we were talking about before. You know, plan trips to see things beautiful that are beautiful in your world. Plan to take the long way home instead of the quick, quick jaunt through the alley. Plan to to have um, special moments of of uh, of joy. You know, we have to sometimes we have to seek out joy. And sometimes even we need we need to re reward ourselves once we've done that hard thing that is maybe, you know, taking taking that extra couple of blocks of a walk to get those steps in and, and reward yourself with those positive sensory experiences. Thanks, Victoria. We have a question that um, might be best suited for you. People are looking for some resources uh, for music therapy. Any that you might suggest that are really helpful, particularly some people are looking for choir ensembles and, and that sort of thing. You know, I think one of the best places to start with that is our places like the Levy Center. The, and I know that you have uh, wonderful music opportunities for taking in music there. Um, there are a few different places in the Evanston area that are uh, offering music for stress and um, and for to, to build your resilience. Often places of worship are great places to get that, um, uh, whether it's your, your temple or your church or your place of worship. Um, often those are great places for things like singing, for things like community bands. Um, I'm not particularly uh, uh, well versed at what's available in the Evanston area, though I do know one excellent organization called the Institute for Therapy Through the Arts. You may want to check their website and see if they're off offering um, programming. They're, they often respond to the needs of the community, so they may have some really great stuff going on right now. Those are just a few. I see um, one comment here that I think is important. Uh, we have two family get togethers coming up within the next six months. Both are on my side of the family. They're going to be attended by at least 50 or more others, maybe even up to 200. My husband's risk factor is greater than mine. And he is saying now that he probably won't attend and feels if I do, I could bring home COVID exposure to him. We are both vaccinated, but younger people at these events might not be or want to be ever. Should I not attend? These are that these that are important to me because of his situation. You know, this is a typical couple communication issue. If you haven't been able to communicate as a couple about things like um, should we visit the kids? Should we have the family come over for dinner? How are we going to do Christmas this year? Um, should we uh, sell the house and buy a new one? If you don't have the skills to communicate, then you're not going to be able to communicate about something big like exposure to COVID. So it's a communication issue, not a this is right or this is wrong. Clearly, the husband in this situation feels it's a higher risk to be exposed. Um, and because of his medical issues, that exposure he's nervous about. Um, but he also has the feeling that the wife, um, if she goes, might um, con contract COVID and bring it home. This is the opening gambit for a discussion. And this is a couple that needs to talk to each other and continue, come up with a way that they both can live with and both can feel comfortable with. There is no right or wrong answer. And the perception of risk might be different on each person's part. 
And it has nothing to do with whether the husband likes her family or she likes his family or whether they like young people or not. It has to do with can we communicate our own vulnerabilities and come up without a motion of a compromise that would work for each of us. So good luck. We have some uh, questions as well as about meditation, people that are unfamiliar about how to meditate and being able to quiet their mind. Um, do you have any recommendations of how one learns to meditate? Um, Victoria, you have some thoughts? Sure. Okay. Um, I can share uh, my approach to that. Um, there are so many, 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 many resources available. And simply doing a Google search to get started is a great way. Um, there's magazines, there's resources in your community that are dedicated to that very thing. I think that sometimes uh, one of the things that is hard about meditation, especially getting started, is the just to to get your body to sit still for a moment and one of the greatest ways to do that is to turn on a timer and i'm not saying 20 minutes or half an hour or something that, like that i'm saying maybe 90 seconds sit with your eyes closed for 90 seconds and um a, a, another thing that you can do is to scan your body very much like dr saper did he went um doing a progressive muscle relaxation from the toes up through uh, the top of us. Um, you can do the same by thinking of like a, a ray of sunshine starting at the top of your head and going down past your forehead, your nose, your chin, and bathing yourself in, in the beautiful warmth of sunlight. And it can be as simple as that. Meditation can be done. You can lay on your bed. You can lay on the floor. You can sit in your chair. One of the things that, that we do say that is good about um, starting meditation practice, though, is to have your, your body in, a, in an even bilateral position. So you don't want to cross your feet. You don't want to cross your arms. You want to just keep your, your left hand and your right hand out to the side and your feet even so that your body feels very much in balance and you're not crossing midline. So those are some, some starter points. Of course, I love music. If listening to music and really intensely actually listening to the music is a way to introduce you to, to meditation, then that's, that's a good strategy too. Um, eventually making the music something that is so benign, such as the sound of, of the wind or a river or um, uh, birds chirping or something like that and, and finding those sorts of sounds as opposed to um, instrumental play. That can sometimes take you into a deeper state of relaxation and calm. And you just, it's a practice, you know? It's like learning how to, to, to do a sport or something. Learning how to sit quiet in your own body is is a practice. So start start slow and small and build up the time as you feel comfortable. We see it as so important, and it, and as Victoria just said, it, practice, practice, practice. Don't give up right away and start small, as she said. But in our psychiatric psychological programs at Amita Health, we teach our patients uh, breathing and we call it mindful present awareness or meditation. We do that every day with them, no matter what program they're in. And we, they find that their report in terms of their growth emotionally and spiritually, that that really has been helpful to them. But the, again, don't give up. You, you, you have to stick with it. Thanks so much. Uh, we have another question um, really about all the time that people have seem to have on their hands now being at home and that sort of thing. They find themselves um, reminiscing or reevaluating their entire life and focusing on all the things that they've done quote unquote wrong and uh, have a hard time breaking that thinking cycle. Any suggestions on how to, you know, mitigate that? Yeah, I, you know, I, the pandemic and this year has allowed us an opportunity to reflect on our lives, what we have achieved, or where we want to go from here. Um, and so we talked a little bit about cognitive flexibility 
um, as you're thinking about all of the negative things or the things you did quote wrong I think it's important to also say, are there any other interpretations to your past life? Um, are there any things, in fact, that you did right? And be allowed to be flexible in your interpretation of your behavior during this your, the, your past years. One of the things that I've taken to is to look through our photos. And you know, we tend to take photos of things that are very positive. It's, it's hard to have a real negative feeling or thought as you're looking through your past photo your years past photos so i suggest sitting down with those photos or taking your phone and going through the photos and saying to yourself what are positives that have come out of this image uh, how do i feel about the good things and the right things that have happened in my life and you can change the way you think you you're not destined to think of all the negatives or all of the things you wish you would have done or could have done or things that you feel like you did quote wrong. Um, you can change your thinking and say, I'd like to see sparks of what went well, what went right and what I'm grateful for. We can encourage all of our clients to really look at gratitude and things in their lives that are grateful, even when this year has been such a pain in the butt. Even when things have been so difficult, we say to our clients, please look at things of what you can be grateful for. And, and we found that patients that go out and help others that are less fortunate than they work at a the soup kitchen or be involved in helping at a vaccination clinic or a cleaning up a litter, you know, by the North Shore Canal, whatever it is that showing gratitude and being thankful for what you do have helps you feel less anxious and depressed. Victoria and Dr. Saber, thank you so much for all of that information. That does conclude our Q&A portion. Do you have anything else you'd like to add before we close out? Thanks, Sam. It was really an honor to be working with Amita and the Levy Foundation. Um, it's been great. And thanks to all those that participated. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you everyone for attending today. I hope you found the presentation informative and helpful. Please be on the lookout for the follow-up email that will include a recap of information and include additional resources as well as a feedback survey. Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you at the next Levy Longevity Series presented by Amita Health. Have a great day.